Well, hi there. Welcome back for this new edition of the Don McCaig Show. We've been on for several years between uh, Carver and Plymouth. Happy to have you. Hope you'll uh, listen and hope you will uh, be informed. Uh, I do a radio show every Saturday on Cape Cod. I, at one time, 20 years ago, when I first started, was on every morning with Ed Lambert. Uh, I have gotten into this business primarily as a, um, a very uh, surprised request from Ernest Bach, Jr., who has passed away, who uh, had bought a television show, w, I mean a, tel a, a radio station, excuse me, down in Yarmouth, and it was WXTK and still is no longer in Yarmouth, no longer on, owned by the Bach family. However, I did it as a lock at first. Ernie asked me if I would uh, like to try it out in the afternoons, and that's how I did. And his reason was that supposedly those on radio, especially talk radio, are most successful if they have had experience in a variety of endeavors throughout their life. Would that we would be so for politicians today? But we'll get into that later. But I had been a businessman, was a businessman when uh, Ernie asked me. I was a teacher for 12 years, high school. I was a coach, football and baseball. I was an entertainer. I did a variety of things. I ran for office in 2000. Uh, so I had that as experience. I am continuing this at my age, in my 70s, because I find that it's very disconcerting. The opinions expressed from so many who have no experience. It's very distressing as a former. I taught high school English. I taught history. I love history. There's a saying, those who do not learn from history or the past are doomed to repeat it. We are in that mode right now. We are following along with the ancient civilizations that came to the same demise that unfortunately, I see us traveling that path. And I am far from a negative person. I am far from someone who wants things to be bad or wants things to be tougher or that, that kind of thing. I want people to be doing the things that over the course of time have proven to work. That's why this country was founded on Christian Judeo principles. Principles that followed the Bible. The Old Testament, which was the Jewish Testament pre Caesar, uh, pre Caesar, pre uh, Jesus, they suffered throughout uh, their existence, and we know the history of Sodom and Gomorrah. We know that there are cultures that fell apart because of a moving away from worshiping a god. Not necessarily a Christian god, but a strong belief in rules and regulations that make any group of human beings more successful. We learn to hear the sayings, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. That's a very serious, serious statement. And it is proven. We have today, this country's in the hands of do-good people who are well-intended perhaps, but they are, more, they are more concerned with their personal self-esteem that they somehow are kinder than the rest of us. Those of us who say no, we somehow are, uh, are uh, diminished in their opinions of us. Parents who are tough, parents who used to spank, 
Now, of course, people call when someone gives a spanking, even when it's warranted or when history has shown that proper upbringing, not abuse, has not damaged the child. Now, I therefore try to go on on a semi-regular basis to talk about what I've learned, my experiences, not my opinion, my experience, fact, not fiction. We watch that television today, we watch that, new, read those newspapers today, and regardless of your position on a particular event, there's a, there's a malevolence there, there's a, an I gotcha. There's not kindness in the coverage. And I'm not just talking about the presidential situation, I'm talking about a lot of other uh, movements or other things that are people are trying. Uh, but this show is, a, is an outgrowth from my radio show, which you can listen to if you like what you hear here. It's on every Saturday on 95.1 FM, WXTK on Cape Cod, and uh, that's from 11 to 1. You can call me on there. We don't have a call in in this particular venue, but hopefully we can go over some of the things that I have learned and that I want as a teacher. Uh, this is a teaching hour, I hope, uh, and a learning hour, I hope, and another side of what you're seeing, I hope. You know, we're no longer country about disagreeing in, in the media. No longer. We're no longer conservative or Democrat. <clears throat> now it's strictly, I believe, rational thinking or irrational thinking. You watch the things that people, young people, college people, the courts, there's a bias toward the criminal. There has been for a long time financially, psychologically, and again, this is dangerous. Even Stephen Fine, but you know, we have a responsibility. Lawyers and the law and the judges have a responsible, have a responsibility to the victims and especially to their families. Now, the selective coverage by this politically correct society that America has become just a couple of days ago, a horrible, horrible event happened. I watched very little coverage of it. No big story. No big story in Boston. Two doctors, they were engaged. One, 49 years old, the male. The other, 29 years old, the female. Both beloved people. Both having gone through, those that know anything about medicine, know how many years it takes to become a doctor. To help people. Now, it, we all know what's going on out there. And it's going on because of, I believe, liberal thinking, bending over backwards to make sure the criminal gets one, two, three, four chances. Forgetting totally the victim and their families. The man's name was Richard Field. His fiance was Lena Bolanus. She's 38, pardon me, he's 49. Convicted bank robber on a green card. The name Ben Puminen Texera from Africa. 30 years old. Have you read it? Have you seen it? The prosecutor is a man named Jesse Bless. 
Now there was a firestorm over this crime, not from the press, because they bend over backwards to protect what they call immigrants. I'm a first generation immigrant. My father came here when he was four. My grandparents came. They stood in line. I say this all the time to show the difference. They had to have a sponsor, a job, a place to live. They had to learn English when they got here so they could read signs. I know that's, a, that's not important. So they could communicate. Now we supply uh, translators at our expense, of course. Anyway, Benjamin, uh, have a Bam Puminum, whatever his name is, was shooting at the police officer who were responding to the call, finding the two doctors with their throats slashed. Now, he had robbed a bank, not once, but I believe twice. <clears throat> the prosecutor, the judge, they let him out before it was a year, because if after a year, he'd have to be deported. They called it a nonviolent crime. Look it up. He didn't have a weapon on him. That's how they described it. He'd handed a note to the bank teller saying he'd kill everyone in the bank if she did not give him the money. Wonderful system here in liberal Massachusetts where I've lived all my life. That's one of the things. We have a system where the budget for the prosecution and defense of criminals in Massachusetts, the budget for the defense is twice, and has been for years, twice what it is for the prosecutors. But that's nice, that's fair. We're very fair, you know, we want, we want things even. Well, socialism has never worked. I was a Democrat all my life. It's coming up on a hundred year anniversary of the birth of John F. Kennedy. Ironically, the first day, the second day that I was on the radio on the Cape, it was an afternoon show from three to five. The Kathy Brown was the girl that was, had been on before. And she got in an automobile accident uh, on her way to work. If you think this is easy sitting here and talking and, and doing a radio show with people calling in, uh, that's not so. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I uh, had brought some notes but never ever thought I was going to be on solo but one of the notes that I had written to myself what it, was it happened to be, it would have been Joseph P. Kennedy, the father, the patriarch of the family, it would have been his 100th birthday, September 6th, uh, 1889, I think. So I was on the radio in 1989. Uh, that was my first time. But anyway, the Democratic Party under John Kennedy, I adored. I was a very uh, committed. I, I was uh, very liberal socially and uh, for social programs and very conservative fiscally. That's John Kennedy. The John Kennedy that they will be celebrating, May 29th, would have been his 100th birthday this month, that won't be the media and all of the pro-Democrat control of the media. Now remember, this is a Democrat talk and I've never been a Republican. I voted Republican, but I'm strictly independent now. And I don't vote for Democrats. That being said, the John Kennedy they will glorify in the next few weeks 
did not believe and would not have had the policies that this Democratic Party and our senators and others would have tolerated. He was in World War II, was injured, saved a couple of fellow uh, men on his, on his uh, PT boat. He would no more, no more accept this foolishness of sanctuary cities where people here illegally. His family came from Ireland, as mine did. Played by the rules. Didn't might, maybe didn't like the rules, but you played by them. But they'll make it out that John Kennedy is what the Democratic Party is, which couldn't be further from the truth. Now, socialism is what the Democratic Party has become. And a lot of people, the schools will not teach socialism. And the schools, public employees, are dedicated to the Democratic Party. That's why we're going broke. Because that's what socialism is, where government now becomes the controller of a majority or a large proportion of the wages. Norman Thomas, fortunately I'm old enough to remember him, he died in 1968. He was a leading American socialist, pacifist, and six-time presidential candidate for the Socialist Party of America. The Socialist Party candidate for President of the United States, Norman Thomas, said in 1944 at a speech at the convention, the American people will never knowingly adopt socialism, but under the name of liberalism, they will adopt every fragment of the socialist program until one day America will be a socialist nation without knowing how it happened. He went on to say, I no longer need to run as a presidential candidate for the Socialist Party. The Democratic Party has adopted our plan. Margaret Thatcher, former British Prime Minister, first lady, I believe, ever, made the statement years later, of course, the problem with socialism is that you eventually run out of other people's money. That's what we're doing. We're doing it locally. You look at your taxes. Again, as a former teacher, my father, my grandparents, John F. Kennedy, Ted Kennedy, who was a friend of mine, griped about his taxes. And to see that 70% of people's property tax goes to schools is outrageous. And again, it's based on emotion, not on good fiscal policy. That being said, we go back to Abraham Lincoln, who, by the way, I keep mentioning, we no longer celebrate on an individual day we have a Martin Luther King Day, which is fine with me, but the man who freed the slaves gave his life up to keep this country one. We don't deem it important that he have a special day, nor do we for George Washington, who without George Washington, we would have no country. Believe me, nothing like this. Well, in 1863, Abe Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, while president, said, the United States will never be defeated by a foreign power. If we lose our freedoms and lose our way, it will be because we destroyed ourselves. 25 years later, Alexander Tyler, a Scottish history professor at the University of Edinburgh, had this to say about the fall of the Athenian Republic some 2,000 years prior. A democracy is always temporary in nature. It simply cannot exist as a permanent form of government. A democracy will continue to exist 
up until the time that voters discover that they can vote themselves generous gifts from the public treasury. But from that moment on, the majority will always vote for the candidates who promise the most benefits from the public treasury with the result that every democracy will finally collapse over loose, unacceptable fiscal policy, which is then always followed by a dictatorship. Does that sound, does that sound uh, possible? No. It doesn't to liberal people. It doesn't to uh, people that are being paid by the public trough. I'll get into the costs of education today. I mean, when you think, I just heard today coming in, the announcement of the college graduates. We're in the May month when they're graduating. And I know a lot about it because I hired hundreds, if not thousands of college kids in the summers. I owned a restaurant called the Flying Bridge in Falmouth on the harbor, and I had 62 to 65 employees. Most of them college grads, except, of course, in the uh, chefs and all that management. And early on, now we're talking 35 years ago, just to show you how out of touch the collegiate world is, I'm going to read you some, because I'm, I'm at war. To me, the next swamp that should be cleansed is education. It is the biggest detriment. Oh, there's some great teachers. There's some people coming out of college that are definitely uh, going to do well. But most are going to come out of college with a debt that's going to hamstring them, going to keep their families low, all because salaries now have been determined just like this professor from Scotland said. Politicians wanting to get reelected, Democrats especially, they control the unions. To me, the war, as a teacher, the worst thing ever happened was a teacher's union, ever. I didn't go in, my wife taught school, I didn't go into teaching to make a lot of money. I knew I wouldn't. I played the piano in the summers. I landscaped. That's the way it used to be. And we got full year-round health care, which they do now. They're now making quadruple that kind of money and it suggests that they should work in the summer. They're outraged. Me work in the summer? 180 days, ladies and gentlemen. Just remember that. I know teachers don't like it, I don't care. Some of you don't like it because your daughter or your granddaughter is teaching or your grandson, I don't care. We're talking fact here. We're talking towns being broke. We're talking a state, just, not just Massachusetts. These states throughout this country have pensions that they would not be able to pay if they come due in their time. They haven't got the pensions. Then we have the idiotic, uninformed politician like our own Elizabeth Warren, who badmouths corporate America, as, as do liberals, as do the Democrats, but they take all sorts of money from them. Former President Obama just gave a speech, $400,000 for the big banks and another 400 for corporate America. No story here. No story here. President Trump leaves the toilet seat up and there's a big story. Just like right now today, he's fired James Comey, the head of the FBI. Two months ago, the press and the Democratic Party was screaming that Comey should have to resign, should, have to, uh, should be fired. Trump does it, they're all over him for it. And they're justifying that because they're still hanging in there on that Russian nonsense. And it's nonsense. Doesn't matter to the politician who, again, 
they paid themselves so much money, they have a retirement after two terms that you and I would kill to have. And that's why they want to stay in. And that's why I've said we should have term limits for every single one of them. Town, state, federal. The answer is, well, if they don't get paid, you're not going to get the quality. That just doesn't, again, that's another pie in the sky bunch of nonsense. Ever since they've raised the cost, uh, 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 the salaries, and the cost to the town, and the state, and the federal government, in general, the quality of educators has gone down because there are those that are going into teaching and going into other government jobs because it's easier. And they're well paid, not much stress. And now you hear all these teachers talking about how horrible it is to teach school, how these kids, not in Kava, not in, I mean, you get, I had all this, so this is what I mean. I know what I'm talking about. I had the tough kids, I had the little kids, I had the fat kids, I had all of that. Oh, maybe that's offensive to someone, right? The do-gooders, you can't use those terms. Let's go back to Abraham Lincoln. Another thing, though, that, that ties into this. You cannot help the poor by destroying the rich. Who's trying to destroy the rich? Not the Democrats that are rich, but they're trying to destroy a president because he's wealthy. There's no, there was no story on the Kennedy's wealth when Jack Kennedy was president. Because it isn't relevant. What's relevant is what kind of a background is he capable or she capable of running the country? You cannot strengthen the weak by weakening the strong. I saw this in sports. There's another bunch of nonsense which now we're, we're seeing the results of with all these picketing and crying, I've talked about this when they ever, after the election, when they had calling classes off in college, no less. Teachers crying, crying in a classroom over a presidential election. Grief counseling. Well, it extended into helping the weak. In other words, those kids I coached, as I say, Hardest things, one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life was to have to cut a really good kid who had tremendous desire, that wanted to play football, that wanted to play baseball, but did not have the physical fitness or the ability. And what so many of these do-gooder and these parents who get their nose into it and are allowed to, is you're jeopardizing a kid's health and safety. If they are not coordinated well, if they are not physically strong, they can get hurt and hurt badly. Oh, but don't talk about that. Well, then came the, the, the neat little thing that's still with us, and now we've got 40-year-olds where every kid has to have a trophy. Every member of a team has to get a trophy. And you can finish in last place 10 games out and you're going to get a trophy. Doesn't that make sense? Everybody wins in life. I'm getting wound up here. You cannot bring about prosperity by discouraging thrift. We don't have any thrift in government today in these towns spending. Take a look. Take a look in Carver. Take a look in Plymouth. Show me one area where one employee or anyone is trying to save the town money. How many police details do they want to cut down? The longer the job, the better the police details. And I'm a big supporter of the police, so don't get on that. I'm a supporter of teachers. There's a big difference between police officers and the police department providing 24-7, and in this climate, than there is in education. You cannot lift the wage earner up by pulling the wage payer down. That's all the Democrat, and believe me, I've had five businesses. Ever since 1960, 
the state of Massachusetts has constantly hammered at small business. We're not talking corporate America. Oh, but get back to, to Elizabeth Warren and these teachers in Harvard and all these colleges that bad mouth to our kids now. You can say it in, your, in, your, in, the, in the teacher's room. Say it to your colleagues, but say it to kids, that's conflict. And to say it to kids is immoral. Because what she doesn't know, this brilliant senator, is she better hope Harvard continues to have their $82 billion in endowments and earnings from the stock market because school teachers, police officers, every other town employee, their pension isn't paid by the town. Their pension is based on where the town's pension fund has been invested. And you people out there, the few that are still listening, maybe, people don't want to hear this because it's the truth. Young people don't want to hear this because, oh, that doesn't apply to me. Well, it does apply to you. They don't want to hear anything that's contrary to what's been fed to them by people, even senators, who don't know their backside from their front. Elizabeth Warren's going to help college tuition costs, but it was okay to get 265, like almost $300,000 a year from Harvard to teach one course. Look it up. It was okay to take money near the end of the election from corporate America. No story here from the Boston Globe. No hypocrisy there. But she won't even admit, and she's not the only one. Marky, the rest of them. Teachers who badmouth corporate America in front of their kids. Well, they better hope that the pension fund is invested in Exxon Mobil, all the big companies, because that's where your pension comes from. But heaven forbid anybody, anybody tells that. And here's the one today that bothers me the most. You cannot further the brotherhood of man by inciting class hatred. That's what we have in the liberal left today. I kid you not. And there's many people, uh, friends of mine, they're liberals. I understand liberals. I understand some of their beliefs. I don't have a problem with that. What I do have a problem with is the extremity that it has gone, the extremes. You cannot build character and courage by taking away people's initiative and independence. A welfare state, ladies and gentlemen, is unhealthy. And instead of us trimming it down, trimming it back, we have done all we can, the powers that be in the Democratic Party, to make more and more people dependent on them. You cannot borrow your way out of debt or spend your way to prosperity. And last, Henry Ford came from a small background, invented the, well, after uh, the car, obviously, but he, uh, he was the first one to have an assembly line which changed uh, so many things in terms of being able to supply the huge growth of the American population, and then, of course, wartime. But the wisdom, again, no college degree. Andrew Carnegie, no college degree. You go right down two-thirds of the people that made this country great. They didn't go to college. So this nonsense that you can't make it is a lot of baloney, too. Yes, it's a help. But it isn't a help when you graduate and you get 150,000-plus debt. Henry Ford said, any man who thinks he can be happy and prosperous by letting the government take care of him had better take a closer look at the American Indian. Of course, now we have to call it Native American. See, we don't want to offend. We don't talk about the issue, which is what Henry Ford's saying. We'd rather let people 
go off on a sidetrack. Oh, oh that's, that's not fair to talk about Indians. Well, coming in, I started to say, and I get off track a little, but some spokesperson for the Department of Education was talking about college graduates and how they, uh, there was only 2.3%, something like that, that uh, weren't going to be able to find jobs. I tell you, right. if you believe that, I will sell you the rainbow. But that being said, in the, the, the dialogue this person was saying, it was just on the news, on the radio, coming in here local. They, this is how, how smug the elite are. And that's, what, that's what's running the, the Democratic Party, and that's what's running the liberal arm of it, the elites. The no, they know more than we do. You know, they have money, a lot of them. Uh, they want, they don't mind paying, uh, you know, ten or twenty thousand dollars for their property tax because their income is like three hundred or four hundred or whatever, or they've got a trust fund. I lived with this, so I know this too. In case you think, and it's not mean spirit. This is called facts. But it's the person making $30,000, the everyday worker, my waitresses, my bartenders, my landscapers, my painters, the people who work for me for 50 plus years. It's them and their families that own a small home and their property tax is ten dollars and $12,000. That's going on in Carver. In Plymouth, I don't know how they're going to afford to live in Plymouth after they pay for the, uh, the septic, huge uh, expense, a new, another school, rebuild of Plymouth South, and the, uh, what is it, the 400th anniversary of 1620, which they're already spending money. I'm sure they're getting grant money. I love there's another one, grants, federal grants. It doesn't cost us anything, federal grants. It's not you and me paying for it. It's, of course, the, the grant writers. <laughs> it's the politicians. They're paying for it. Well, anyway, so that's how this particular news report came. They, don't, they, they finally said, this gentleman said, well, there may not be the jobs that there used to be, but uh, even though salaries will be less, the percentages are still very high. Now, do you pick up on that, you parents that have just been pen spending forty and fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year to send Mary or Billy or whatever to college? Who's going to pick that up? But when they graduate, never mind those who can't get jobs, and there are a lot. But how about those who can't make enough money in the job they get to pay back their debt? How about the huge influx of 35 to 45 year old couples with kids who are moving back in with their mothers and fathers because they can't afford to pay their bills a large part of the bills being education. Take a look at what we're paying the heads of our colleges around here in this state, just the state. And I'm talking about community colleges where they get a house, they get transportation, they get full insurance, and they can make from 93,000 up to 180, 190. I went to the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. The president up there, under whom there are like five or six, by the way, thanks to uh, Billy Bulger. Billy Bulger took that job, got that job. Now it's years ago. It paid $160,000. In five years, he was making 500. And he had three others as his aides at 150. 
Take a look at your high school principals. See what they're making. And on top of that, they have an assistant principal. Then they have a dean of this, a dean of that, a dean. I saw this all coming when I was teaching. And remember, the town matches all withholdings, Social Security. These aren't nice things to hear. I'm not here to entertain. I'm here to inform. And it's all coming to roost. And because Donald Trump is challenging the past, they hate it. You take a look at what these newscasters make. They talk about him uh, giving his, uh, his taxes. <laughs> what would happen if you asked those reporters, all those big shots that you see on the, on the news, hey, how much do you make anyway? How many hours do you work? Oh my God, you can't ask that. How are you doing for time, Chris? We got 19 minutes. Left. All right. Well, on, on my radio show and then on this show, because it means a lot to me, and hopefully you hear my passion. It, it's not anger, it's frustration. I feel for young people, Chris is right here that works here, and all the young people that work so hard. And it's a tough world out there. It's very expensive to live. The overheads are difficult. And I feel so badly, as I mentioned President Kennedy in 1960, when I was at the University of Mass and he became president, it was so exciting. The political climate, always oh, tough. Politics has always been dirty business. Behind the scene tricks. But never, ever was it allowable, allowable for either party to be so disrespectful for a president. Some of you might think he deserves it. Let me tell you, he's an odd duck. He says and does things that have made me cringe. Would I have chosen him if there was a better field? Maybe not. But what people refuse to realize is why he won. Why was there a Hitler? Why were the Tsars overthrown in Russia? And then why did it become a man like Stalin? Because the everyday person was being squeezed. World War I, the greed of the victors, of which we were one. But we weren't greedy. President Wilson, he wanted to have what was basically the answer to today's United Nations. He wanted to unite, no, but other countries, the leadership, after that horrible World War I, they left Germany wiped out, desolate. Never mind the, the physical plant of Germany. Never mind the devastation, loss of homes, lives, everything. They made it impossible for Germany to recover. They were taking marks, German marks, which I think are the, were the equivalent of our dollar, in wheelbarrows where they could, and, and to buy a quart of milk or a loaf of bread. Along comes Hitler. He produces the Volkswagen, which is the people's car, it means. People could afford to have a car. He created jobs. Now, this is not supporting Hitler, so don't go there. But the atmosphere was such that the German people were on their knees and struggling, and no one in the rest of the world wanted to acknowledge that and help. Then, when Hitler became strong, they didn't want to confront him, which is typical. Again, the wealthy, 
the ones who didn't fight the war, the ones who didn't lose sons and daughters and, and their home. The reason Donald Trump is in the White House is because a very large amount of people do not like the present form, not the form of government, but the present individuals in there, which goes back to what I was selling, telling you about we need term limits. Then you'd get more pay and lower the salaries. Salaries are out of control. And they're permanent. And, and by the way, Congress, you know, this is both parties now. This is not, this is the political establishment. It is corrupted. These politicians say what they can to please the media. Those who would support Trump aren't interviewed. They aren't. Sometimes a mistake, somebody gets on, says a positive thing, and boom, you don't see it on the news again. They are corrupt. The media is corrupt, and it's run by a leftist majority. Again, how's our time, Chris? Okay, well, I want to go through what I've done before. Oh, by the way, just uh, let's get back to the, uh, this is what goes on in colleges. Yeah, listen to this. I, 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 I write these things down. Because they're, they're all true, but you, you'll never see them on any criticism because, again, the elite educational uh, market is, oh, they're so wonderful. Southern Illinois University at Carbondale, this is in Illinois, of course, we're living the dream thanks to the Dreaming Diversity Art Installation Display. This is another thing, this diversity. Malaki. The school's Morris Library nappins, that's in quote, in March, to help students dream of diversity. They have the, they have the student. These are college kids. In the library, they have them take little nappins and lay there and dream of diversity. All the blacks and the, the yellows, the India, just lay there and dream along. After the NAPS reports the student run Daily Egyptian, undergrads are encouraged to write down their dreams and pin them to a 15 foot high fabric scroll hanging in the library rotunda. This is college, folks. A labyrinth was installed nearby to guide students to their dreams. We gotta help this again. Grief counseling because Hillary Clinton didn't win an election, or anyone else. Grief counseling, calling off an exam, rooms set aside to cry. 20-year-old kids going out into the world, boy, that's great preparation. Okay, according to artist Marissa M. Pasta, who created the exhibit as a, quote, a metaphor for the general path to diversity, mm, That'll put you to sleep. Meanwhile, an SIUC, that's Southern Illinois University at Carbondale, students slumbered. They were taking naps. While millions of other students in China, India, and elsewhere were wide awake mastering engineering, physics, business, and mathematics. You wonder why corporate America for years has been leaving the country, going to India, to China, to other countries to recruit jobs. You won't hear that from the uh, NEA. I'm a teacher. I know what goes on, what did go on, and it's worse. Imagine taking naps to bring in diversity when you're supposed to study. Now, when I went to University of Mass, again, common sense is dead. Um, this is a long time ago we're talking. We're talking almost 50 years ago. Tell me what brain, real brain, that cares about kids' attention. That's what education is. And that's what real learning is, is discipline, self-discipline. 
where you focus on what's at hand, whether it be a subject, a sport, a musical instrument, a marriage, a parenting job, focusing on it. It's not la di da worrying about other side events. Doesn't mean you don't care. It is, <laughs> it just is so incredible. Well, up at UMass, about five or six years, late 60s, after I left, some brilliant person, of course, the, the, the state took over, the Democrats took over, spent fortune up at the university, and Amherst this was. And they came up with a brilliant idea of co-ed dormitories. Now, j just, just tell me, tell me this, why? We used to have to get a date home during the week by 10, 10.30 at night. We went out on a date or went to a, we used to have dinners, mixes, fraternities and sororities and other schools. On the weekends, if they stayed on campus, you had to have them home by midnight, maybe one, I don't know. That was it. They used to flick the lights on and off, the house mothers. Oh, that's a terrible thing, isn't it? To make kids know that it's important to be home, to be studying, to be disciplined. But the liberals have all the answers. That's why we have so much improvement in drug abuse, suicides. But don't look at that. Look at other things like, can you imagine expecting people that come into this country to come in legally, to stand in line like so, so many thousands? We are still bringing in immigrants legally. By the way, to end the show, I just saw something I had until last week down in Hyannis on a truck. It said, illegal aliens are not immigrants. That's the truth. They're not immigrants because, first of all, they're not legal. They are aliens, which is foreigners coming into a country illegally. Try doing what the Mexicans do to us to get into Mexico. But again, heaven forbid that we ever get that coverage on our wonderful news. Facts, not fiction. This is Don McCaig. I hope you've enjoyed some of it, and I hope you'll tell your children, your grandchildren, or if you are, tell your classmates. Happy Mother's Day. God bless you. And uh, hopefully we'll uh, continue this next week. Goodbye.